I want to introduce to you tonight a theme based on the anointing, which I will try to define. And uh, I want to read to you from 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, beginning at verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what you shall do, you, and you shall anoint for me him whom I will declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, and probably said, according to one version, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, Well, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him. For we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. One phrase from the verse 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. May God be pleased to bless the reading and the preaching. Of this, his most holy and infallible word. I want to pray. Heavenly Father, I ask now for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus by your spirit to rest upon every mind in this place in order that their perception of what I say will be heard as you intend. Cleanse my tongue that I will be your transparent vehicle to pass on all that needs to be said, nothing that doesn't need to be said. Help me to be very, very clear, very, very simple, and let this be a life-changing word, and a word that brings great honor and glory to your name. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. On vacation many years ago, I was doing my Robert Murray McShane Bible reading, 
And what it, the funny thing was, I wasn't particularly in a holy mood. Sometimes, to be honest, I just go through it. I don't want to miss. And we were on holiday in Florida, and I was, couldn't wait to get out and go fishing. But I wanted to do this before I left. So part of the reading that day was 1 Samuel 16. And lo and behold, like a laser beam flashing three different directions, I saw yesterday's man, today's man, tomorrow's man in this verse. The Lord said to Samuel, who is a type of today's man, how long will you grieve over Saul, yesterday's man, since I've rejected him from being king over Israel? So you, Samuel, today's man, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons, David, tomorrow's man. Now, there are three categories of people potentially here tonight. Probably only two, but there could be, possibly, Yesterday's man or woman in this place, possibly. I doubt it, but it's possible. Today's man, almost certainly. And tomorrow's man or woman, described in this verse. Now, there's a little irony here. Yesterday's man wore the crown, but forfeited the anointing. Because it says in verse 14, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And... God said to Samuel, how long will you grieve for Saul since I've rejected him? And so Saul is yesterday's man, but he still wore the crown. Verse 13, it says, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David. And here is the man who was given the anointing, but he did not wear the crown. And so you have the crown without the anointing. You've got the anointing without the crown. If you had a choice, which would you rather have? The crown without the anointing, that way you'd have the power. Or would you want the anointing without the crown? That means nobody knows who you are. No power, no following, no mailing list. You're a nobody, but you've got the anointing. But there would be those who say, well, I want the crown. I want the power. I want the prestige. I want the glory. I want the following. And so translate that in today. I'm sorry, but there are those in high places, in places of strategic power and authority, who are yesterday's men and women, but their following don't know it. Only Samuel knew that Saul was yesterday's man. Now, we're not talking about age or retirement. You can be young and be tomorrow's man. You can be old and be tomorrow's man. You can be young and be yesterday's man. King Saul was only 40. I call that young. And yet, <laughs> excuse me, sir, have we met? You, you like my shirt, don't you? <laughs> you could be old and be tomorrow's man. God did not use Moses until he was 80. I find that very encouraging. <laughs> and so, we're living in a time when people admire prestige, power, fame. And there are those, as I say, prominent places. They still have the power. They've got the authority. They've got the prestige, they've got the leadership, they've got the mailing lists, and they've got the following. But they're yesterday's men. 
But there are those who have no following. They've got no prestige, no power. They've got the anointing. But the further irony is that David had the anointing. But it would be another 20 years before he would wear the crown. And so, how would it make you feel if you are tomorrow's man or woman, and your time has not yet come, and you think that maybe today after tomorrow or next week, you'll come into your ministry and come into what you've been called to do? And what if you knew in advance it would be another 20 years? Don't think you could cope very well, but David didn't know that. If only... Samuel had said to David, oh, by the way, David, I almost forgot to tell you, it will be another 20 years before you're going to be king. And you're going to spend the next 20 years running from King Saul just to stay alive. But not to worry, it's part of your preparation. But David couldn't have coped with that. God didn't tell him that. So he went one day at a time. But King Saul, he still wore the crown, and he went on as if nothing happened. As someone has put it, if the Holy Spirit were completely taken from the church today, speaking generally, the church would go right on, 90% of the church would go right on as if nothing happened. And that can happen to an individual. A person can be highly gifted. It comes from what we call common grace, special grace in nature. All people have that. And because of their gifting, they can go right on without the special anointing. Now, anointing is a tricky term, kind of hard to define. It means the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, But it refers tonight, I want it to refer tonight in this way. It is the conscious approval of God. When you know God is with you. And it is a conscious thing. And there's nothing more precious than knowing that you please the Lord. He's with you. Now, a danger that we all face, and I I pray every day. You pray every day, Rory, for this church. I pray every day that I won't be like uh, Mary and Joseph, who went a whole day's journey without Jesus, and didn't realize that he stayed back in Bethlehem, they went on toward Galilee thinking that Jesus was in their company. And they found out that they'd done a day's journey, and he wasn't with them. And it's so easy to do, to think the Lord's with you, and just move on in your plans, and one day God says, I didn't tell you to do that. I haven't been with you on that. And you have to go all the way back to Jerusalem And start all over. And it can be very humbling. Now, I said, I don't believe yesterday's man is here. Uh, The thing is, if you were yesterday's man, you probably wouldn't admit it. You can't ever get yesterday's man to admit he is that. And for one thing, he wouldn't know it. Because when the Lord departs from you, you lose objectivity about yourself. And King Saul became completely unteachable. Now, what is required when it comes to the anointing is that you are able to come to terms with your gifting. And this can be very humbling. We all have an anointing, but it's not the same in everybody. And it often will connect to what you are good at at the natural level. If you want to know what God wants you to do in your life, chances are you begin with what you're good at. And the anointing will come upon that. And so the anointing is what makes your gift function easily. You go outside your anointing, you struggle. Many years ago, there was a book called The Peter Principle. The thesis of the book was that every person is promoted to the level of their incompetence. The idea being that a vacancy takes place and a person is moved up, 
And as long as he was sweeping floors, he did fine. But now he's given a job of responsibility and he can't cope. Or the typist becomes the manager of the office. She or he were doing fine as a secretary. But now made manager, uh, they have a nervous breakdown. Or the manager becomes vice president. He was doing fine as manager, but now he's given high responsibility. His marriage breaks down and he can't cope. Promoted to the level of their incompetence. And the idea of that book, the Peter Principle, that everybody's promoted to the level of their incompetence. And this is why machinery breaks down. This is why uh, uh, things you use at home all the time break up. It's because the person on the assembly line wasn't able to work, do that job. And you're left with a product that doesn't work. That's why cars break down. This is just, this is all over the world. That may be true, generally speaking. But the Holy Spirit will never promote you to the level of your incompetence. You may promote yourself. You may be so ambitious or so determined to have more prestige that you are aiming for that job. It can happen to a pastor who wants a bigger church. It can happen to a a person who's got a big church, wants even a bigger one. And for various reasons, they manage to pull strings and because they're well-connected, they get that job, but they're doing fine until ambition takes over. But the Holy Spirit will never promote you to the level of your incompetence. What he calls you to do, you will be able to do. But it does require that each of us develops a certain objectivity about ourselves. Three years ago, I started reading a verse every day. I'll read it to you now. I still read it every day. I read it this morning. I will read it tomorrow. I know it so well, I wouldn't even have to read it, but I need to. Here's what it says. It's Romans 12, 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith. There's the key. Measure of faith. The word measure means limit. You see, you've got a measure of faith, but you don't have a perfect faith. Jesus was given the Holy Spirit without limit, John 3.34. But you don't have the Holy Spirit without limit. You have a measure of faith. And you have to come to terms with the fact that you can't be somebody that you may aspire to be like. And so some years ago, I came to terms with the fact that I'm no Jonathan Edwards. I'm no Martin Lloyd-Jones. I come from Kentucky. By the way, I don't want anybody here to feel intimidated by my presence tonight. You don't get somebody from Kentucky every day. And I... I don't want you to think, you know, that I am better than you. I don't think I'm better than you. I probably am. I just don't think it. (laughs) I realize you can't help it that you weren't born in Kentucky. But if you knew about Kentucky and live in America, you'd understand when I'm aware, I don't deserve to be here. And uh, here I find myself in the pulpit, Westminster Chapel, where G. Campbell Morgan, Mark Lloyd-Jones, giants had made Westminster Chapel famous, and now I'm there. And I had to come to terms with the fact that I'm not like them. And, but I also knew God put me there. And it's important that you come to terms with the limit of your anointing. You've got to do what you're able to do and not promote yourself to the level of your incompetence. Well, now, how did King Saul become yesterday's man, and he was only 40. Well, I want us to look at that, because it's easily found. You Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 13, and it is when Samuel told uh, Saul to wait until he got back, and he would offer the burnt sacrifices. And so uh, we're told that uh, King Saul waited for a whole week and uh, the time appointed by Samuel. But for some reason, Samuel was late 
And King Saul got impatient, and he did something. He crossed over a line. And it may seem innocent, but he was crossing over a line in the ceremonial law. Now, the Mosaic law is threefold, moral, civil, ceremonial. Moral law, Ten Commandments. Civil law, the way the people of Israel should govern themselves. Ceremonial law, how God wanted to be worshipped. And God knew exactly how he wanted to be worshipped. And part of the ceremonial law was only the person called of God could offer the burnt sacrifice. Well, that was what Samuel, who was called of God, was going to do. And he told Saul, wait till I get there. But Saul got impatient, and he said, bring me the burnt offerings. Someone should have said, uh, your majesty, are you sure you should do that? But no one did. And if they had, he would have said, I'm king, aren't I? Don't tell me what I can do. Bring me the burnt offerings. And he did it. Consciously going right against Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, ceremonial law. You might think, well, that's just a small thing. God is the one who wrote it. And about the time he finished the burnt offerings, Samuel arrived. And you read it in 1 Samuel 13. And Samuel says to Saul, what have you done? Oh, well, Saul said, you weren't here. You said you'd be here. You weren't here. And, and, I, and I, uh, I felt compelled. That's the way one person puts it. I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Have you ever heard anybody say, God told me to do this? And then you say, wait a minute. Where is it in the Bible? Well, I don't care if it's in the Bible or not. God told me. Let me tell you the fast track to becoming yesterday's man. And that's when you put yourself above Holy Scripture. The greatest mistake you can make is to underestimate the infallibility of Scripture. And when you think that you have a word, well, I don't know if it's in the Bible or not, but God told me. Be very careful. This is the way you become yesterday's man. If you want to become yesterday's man, just put yourself above Scripture. And so Samuel says to him, uh, you've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. For had you done this, he would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. 1 Samuel 13, verse 14 says, But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And from that moment... He was yesterday's man, but he continued to go on as king. No one would have known it. No one would have known it. Some time ago, a Chinese pastor was given a tour of American churches, and he saw the big ones, the titanic churches, the huge churches. And uh, at the end of the tour, they asked this Chinese pastor, well, what is your opinion of American churches? And the Chinese pastor said, I am amazed at how much you accomplish without God. You can continue on. You wear the crown. You've got the prestige. You've got the following. But you can lose the anointing. God rejected him. Then specifically, it is said, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Learn to appreciate God's Word. As I said today, He's exalted His Word above His name. He cares more about His integrity than He does His reputation. He can live with what people say about Him, because He'll clear His name on the last day. But in the meantime, He He's very concerned about the integrity of his word. You see, the Bible is God's integrity put on the line. And the degree to which you honor Scripture will be representative of how much he can honor you and trust you. Well, King Saul 
yesterday's man. Another thing about how you become yesterday's man, and that is you are not accountable to anybody. You see, Saul was supposed to be accountable to Samuel. Samuel discovered Saul. And Saul was indebted to Samuel. But Saul outgrew Samuel. And he didn't need him anymore. And he wasn't accountable. And I don't care who you are. You're not so spiritual that you don't need to be accountable to people who know all about you and will put painful questions to do. You know, I've got people that are not afraid of me. Lyndon is an example. Uh, I've got others. <laughs> is there a policeman in the house? I've got friends who will say, where are you right now? How is it with you and Louise? What's going on in your private life? I need that. There's a man, if I gave his name, most of you would recognize it. He asked to be a member of Westminster Chapel, famous for his prophetic gift. In fact, I've never seen anything quite like it. And he wanted to be a member of Westminster Chapel, and we broke the rules my mistake. We let him in. As soon as he got what he wanted, he never returned my phone calls, didn't write. I caught up with him four or five years later when he happened to be in London, and I said to him, you're supposed to be accountable to us. I don't know who you're accountable to, but I would say to you, if you're not careful, you're going to be yesterday's man. And he wept. And I thought, that's good. Maybe he's listening. But the next day, his spirit changed, and I knew he wasn't listening. Two years later, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. I can take you almost to the gate where my friend Jack Taylor said, have you heard about so-and-so? I said, no, what do you mean? You don't know? No, what? He said, well, he's had a moral freefall. And it turned out that this same man who was not accountable, was living a double life. And he's finished. You need to be accountable. Nobody's so spiritual. You see, here's the famous last words of yesterday's man. I'm accountable to God. Nobody's that spiritual. King Saul then became overwhelmed with jealousy. He became more jealous of David than it was the whole Philistine army. One man, because of his anointing, he was jealous. And so one of the things that typifies yesterday's man, filled with jealousy, so afraid that somebody's going to excel, get ahead, jealous of another person's anointing. Now, I'm not here to give anybody a guilt trip. But if you're, and we've all got a problem with jealousy, but be very careful. If it gets out of hand, this is what happens. The reason I'm spending time on yesterday's man, not because I think yesterday's man or woman is here, because if you were here, you wouldn't be that teachable. Here's the reason. The person that is yesterday's man is a Hebrews 6 situation person where it says those that tasted the heavenly gift, partakers of the Holy Spirit, uh, when they fell away, could not be renewed again. This is talking about true Christians. They don't lose their salvation, but they never hear God speak anymore. They become stone deaf to the Holy Spirit. This is why God said in Hebrews 3.10, I swear in my wrath they will not enter my rest. They have not known my ways. And so... People like that, they become unteachable. If, as I've been speaking, it's crossed your mind, oh dear, could I be yesterday's man or woman? If you had that thought, good. That means you're teachable and you're sensitive. But if you say, I don't get a thing out of this, you just go through one and out the other, not a good sign. 
as long as you're worried that you might be, good sign. Let's move on. Today's man, exemplified by Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king? Now fill your horn with oil and be on your way. For I provided myself a king. Uh, he will be of the uh, house of Bethlehem, son of Jesse. And Samuel immediately said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. We're talking now about yesterday's man, and we'll put him to one side right now. All of you are at least today's men or women, all of you. But let me warn you, the way you keep from becoming yesterday's man is that you will follow the example of Samuel. And that means you may have to go outside your comfort zone. The way to keep from becoming yesterday's man is you go outside your comfort zone. You have to keep doing it. You see, the first thing God says to Samuel, go, anoint somebody, king. Samuel says, I can't do that. Saul will hear it and kill me. Imagine being told that you now are to anoint the next king. And the king is very much alive, and he's going to live another 20 years. And Samuel says, how can I do it? Saul will kill me. And God showed him a way to do it. But it shows that Samuel had to go outside his comfort zone. And maybe you love being just where you are. You're happy. You're not being challenged. You're not being persecuted. It's all lovely. And what if God says, you've got to go outside your comfort zone? That's what Samuel had to do. And that is what every person to stay, today's man, has got to be willing to do. I remember when we were at Westminster Chapel, we took risks. And at uh, uh, one stage, what we did was so serious in the eyes of some of my deacons that they actually tried to get me fired. And uh, it looked like they were going to win. And, uh, but by the grace of God, we survived, and the church got rid of them, and we, we, we managed. And those were the hardest days Louise and I ever went through, the worst ever. And after we survived, I said to myself, never again am I going to do anything that's going to cause trouble like that. And the angel said, really? And would you believe it wasn't long till I had to do something again? It was even more dangerous. And then when I did that, I had to do it again. And I think, well, Samuel, surely God wouldn't make him do this. He was a legend in his own time. Samuel was. He was, he was the man. You would have thought that God would say, Samuel, I'm proud of you. You've done a good job. I want you to just take a holiday and you can go to Cape Town and just rest. Enjoy the rest of your days. But no, Samuel, he's an old man. He still, he still has to go outside his comfort zone. And maybe there's somebody here like that. You say, well, RT, I have proved that I would obey the Lord. And uh, he knows that I will do what I want him to do. I've proved it. And I don't have to do anything more. And it could be that God has sent you here tonight to let you know that he's not finished with you yet. You're today's man. You're today's woman. And you are being challenged. Jonathan Edwards taught us that the task of every generation is to discover in which direction the sovereign redeemer is moving, then move in that direction. And so it is. You need to see what God is leading you to do. And how can you know in what direction the sovereign redeemer is moving unless you have the kind of relationship with him that he can show you what to do? And this is a word for solid ground church. You've got an opportunity, an opportunity to shake this part of South Africa. And God is looking for those 
who are willing to go outside their comfort zone. It may cost you. It may cost you everything you've got. It may cost you your reputation. It may mean that your friends turn their back on you. It's the question whether you want more anointing. And the way to maintain the anointing and not lose it is you become teachable. And the willingness to go where God tells you to do. And so Samuel now comes to the house of Jesse. And the first thing is he sees Eliab. And as soon as he sees Eliab, he says, oh, good, this is going to be easy. He says, this is the Lord's anointed. Now, that's easy for somebody to come to that conclusion because Eliab was the firstborn. And in ancient Israel, the firstborn got double the inheritance. So it was very natural for Samuel to say, Eliab, congratulations, you're the one. And as soon as Samuel thought that and hinted it, and the whole family thought it was going to be Eliab, the Lord says, hold it. Do not look on his appearance or his height, for the Lord does not see man as people. He doesn't look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And here comes part of the greatness of Samuel. He might have said, I can't reverse my opinion in front of all these people. I'm Samuel, Lord. You know, they think I'm wonderful, great, you're a prophet. And, 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 and I've indicated it's going to be a lie. Uh, bail me out of this. Uh, I'm going to lose my reputation. There are prophetic people like that. They speak before God told them to, and they won't admit they got it wrong. We're living in a time when prophetic people, and I don't mean to be unfair if there's anybody here like this, but I caution you, they love to use the phrase, thus saith the Lord. Stop it. What you're doing is not trying to make the Lord look good. You're trying to make yourself look good. The greatness of Samuel was that he climbed down in front of all of them and said, I made a mistake. I got it wrong. And so, disappointed though Jesse was because he wanted to be his firstborn. Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass before Samuel. And Samuel says, this is odd. It's not him. Well, Jesse had Shammah pass by. And Samuel says, it's not that one. And then Jesse said, don't worry, we got a bunch of them. And he had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And now by this time, Samuel thinks he's really lost his prophetic gift. He says, I'm sorry. I came here to anoint the next king, but but he's not here. Uh, Is it possible? Are these all your sons? Well, Jesse says, we've got one more, but you don't want him. He's the runt of the family. He's a shepherd. He's out with the sheep. Get him. We won't eat until he comes in. Now they go and get a man underestimated by his father. Jesse didn't even tell David that the great Samuel was coming to the house for dinner. David would have missed the whole thing. He's out with the sheep. Maybe you know what it is to miss a great church service. And you think, well, if God really loved me, I would have been there. Or you miss something and you think, God doesn't care about me. Listen, David could have thought that God knows where you are and he'll find you. And they won't move on until your name is called. God has a plan for you that he's got for no one else. And all you need to do is just wait for your time to come. And so here comes in David. You know, he doesn't even know what's going on. The next thing you know, he's anointed a king. Samuel, willing to admit he made a mistake, and he's going to go wherever the anointing is. You see, this is the thing about being today's man. You've got to go where the anointing is. You've got to be willing to appreciate somebody God would choose that you wouldn't choose. You see, it's one thing to... Say, well, we want to see revival come to Middleburg, but if it does, it must come here. 
must come here. <laughs> For many years at Westminster Chapel, we used to say, what if revival came to all souls laying in place, but not Westminster Chapel? Would we affirm it? What if revival came to Kensington Temple, but not Westminster Chapel? Would we affirm it? You see, I, that was good to say those things. I never thought I'd have to do it. One day, uh, we're having a meal with uh, two of my friends, Lyndon Bowery and Charlie Colchester, who was church warden of Holy Trinity Brompton. And Charlie speaks up while we're having a Chinese dinner in Gerard Street in Soho, London, and said to Linda to me, have you heard about this Toronto thing? What? What do you mean? Well, um, Toronto, they pray for people and they fall to the floor and laugh their heads off. What? Yeah, he said, last uh, Sunday night, my wife and I left at 11 o'clock at night and 50 bodies of our friends on the floor and they're just laughing their heads off. He said, what do you guys think of this? Well, if you'd put me under a lie detector and ask me, did I think that was of God? I would say, no. I find that sickening. I find that despicable. Besides, if it really was of God, it would have come to Westminster Chapel first. <laughs> well, sometime later, Ken Costa, banker, South African, he phoned me. He's a key member of Holy Trinity Brompton. And said, R.T., do you have any sermons on 1 John 4, 1, 2, 3, 4? I said, yeah, I've got four. He sent his courier over. And he read those four sermons. He said, something's going on at Holy Trinity. And I just want to make sure it's of God. And then he read the sermons and invited me out to lunch. And when he invited me out to lunch, I came armed to warn him of this. Because if it was really of God, we at Westminster Chapel had borne the heat of the day. We at Westminster Chapel were out on the streets witnessing to the lost. I nearly lost my job defending the faith. I could go on and on. And if revival is going to come, it'll come to Westminster Chapel. And I hear it's going on at Holy Trinity Brompton. I think that cannot be. It can't be God. First of all, the Church of England. We all know the Church of England is apostate. And... Uh, the staff, they're all Etonians with their posh accents. They don't say Holy Trinity, it's Holy Trinity. You know, <laughs> God wouldn't do that. I felt betrayed. So I'm having lunch with Ken, ready to warn him. He's not there to convince me of anything. He just is, wants to get it right. In the meantime, I had warned Westminster Chapel publicly. This is not God. You see, we had a prayer covenant in those days. 300 people prayed every day for this, for the manifestation of God's glory in our midst, along with an ever-increasing openness in us to the way God may choose to manifest His glory. The reason I worded it that way is that uh, I know a little church history, and I know that God can sometimes show up in strange ways. In fact, speaking of Kentucky, I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of Cane Ridge. It's in Bourbon County, Kentucky, in 1801. It was the beginning of the camp meetings. 15,000 people gathered. They came in their church wagon, uh, they came in their covered wagons from uh, five states. And on one Sunday morning in July, 1801, a Methodist preacher stood on the top of a fallen tree. 15,000 people, some say 30, but I'm being conservative. 15 to 20,000 heard as he spoke. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the things done in the body, whether they be good or bad. And as he began to exegete the sermon and preach, the fear of God came on the people and they began to fall. Nobody was praying for them. Nobody pushed them. They fell by the hundreds. They thought they were dead at first. And then they'd come up shouting, Hallelujah, I'm saved. Salvation was real to them. And others would fall for four days. There were no fewer than 500 on the ground. They called it the sound of Niagara. 
You could hear them a mile away. It's called America's Second Great Awakening. And that happened in Kentucky. And I thought if this were to happen at Westminster Chapel, I don't know what they're going to think. That's why we prayed every day, 300 people, for the manifestation of God's glory in our midst, along with an ever-increasing openness in us to the way he chooses. So we'd be ready. And I was sure, I was so sure, that it would come to Westminster Chapel. That day as Ken Costas spoke, and I saw the glow on his face, and he just began to describe what was going on. I said, Ken, I think I've made a big mistake. I think this thing's of God. And I've told my people, it's not of God, and I think I've been wrong. I called Louise. I said, I've made a mistake. I called the deacons together. I've been wrong. They said, we're with you. I went to the pulpit, climbed down publicly. We prayed that day for Holy Trinity Brompton, Sandy Miller, the vicar, they became like a sister church. Nikki Gumbel's there now. God has given me a great relationship with these people. It's not what I wanted. It's not where I wanted it to be. And I finished my 25 years. Revival never came. Never came. The great disappointment of my life. You might not like to know that what kept me there for so long was that I honestly thought revival would come and I thought, then I can go back to America. And after I'd been there 23 years, I asked myself this question. I wasn't praying. I just thought, how long am I going to stay here? When will I admit maybe it's not going to happen? I thought, I know what. I'll stay 25 years, then I'll call it quits. Then I thought, well, what will I do then? Go back to America? Nobody knows me. I'll just fish 25 hours a day. I'll become a recluse. And I I was, was, uh, that's what I'll do. And in that moment, I heard this. Your ministry in America will be to charismatics. I said, oh, no. Please. If I'm going to have a ministry, let it be to evangelicals. I have what they need. I've got the credentials. I know how they think. Surely, to evangelicals, no. Charismatics. Then I thought of the Apostle Paul. He wanted to reach Jews. God said, no, Gentiles. He thought, oh no, please. But that was his ministry. And so now in my old age, 80 to 90% of my ministry all over the world, charismatics. Don't know that I've done that much good, if any. All I know is that this has been my ministry. And I live for one thing. I may see it in my lifetime. I hope I do. I have reason to think I will, but I'm not sure that one day the Word and the Spirit will come together. The simultaneous combination will be spontaneous combustion. When I first made this statement in 1992 at Wembley Conference Center in London, I prophesied that the day would come, the Word and the Spirit would come together, and the greatest revival since Pentecost would take place before the coming of Jesus. If I've got it right, that's a big if, and I'm not pushing this, but if I've got it right, the next thing to happen on God's calendar is not the second coming, but the awakening of the church just before, as in the midnight cry, the bridegroom tarried, and at midnight, the word midnight comes from three Greek words, that means middle of night. It's when the church is in a deep, Deep sleep. Imagine yourself two o'clock in the morning. You're not wanting a wake-up call. And that's where the church is today, in a deep, deep sleep, expecting nothing. The next thing to happen will be this awakening that will turn the church upside down, and it will spread all over the world. Well, after I gave that address back in Wembley, a week later, somebody came up to me and said, did you get that from Smith Wigglesworth? I said, no. I'd heard the name. I knew that he healed people by punching them in the stomach and stuff like that. I didn't know it was prophetic. Oh, he said the same thing you did. 
I thought you got it from him. I said, no, I'm glad to know he said it. He said the same thing. You can go online, Google Smith Wigglesworth 1947 prophecy, and it's all there. Same thing. That encourages me. And this is what I live for. And it is going to happen when we least expect it. There's no way to pray it in. There'll be a no announcement five minutes before. But when it comes, you won't need to say, is this it? It'll be a wake-up call. It'll make 9-11 look like nothing. That is on the agenda. The spontaneous combustion following simultaneous combination of word and spirit. And this is the next thing, in my view, to happen on God's calendar. The question is, how does that make you feel? You think, oh dear, this is going to be the biggest interruption of things I plan to do. This is going to interrupt my schedule. You talk about going outside comfort zone. This will be it big time. When I was uh, just uh, 19, 20 years old, I had what I call my Damascus Road experience. When driving in my car, the glory of the Lord filled the car, and I saw Jesus interceding for me. It was more real than you are right now. At the right hand of God, there he was interceding for me. The days following that, I began to have visions. And I saw an awakening that goes right around the world. And the world wasn't expecting it, wasn't ready for it, but it came. But if this word tonight could be just a quiet wake-up call to make you search your heart and say, could I possibly be in a sleep and not know it? Say, God, wake me up. Wake me up. Because it'll be people like you I think that God would use, and this is fertile ground for this part of South Africa to be shaken. And I think that's part of the reason I'm giving this message. Uh, Tomorrow morning, I want to talk about tomorrow's man, tomorrow's woman, and what it means and how to know that you might be precisely that. The question now is, are you willing to go outside your comfort zone? And are you willing to go where the anointing is? And what if God did not use you after all? Would you affirm it if it was somebody else? One of the hardest things I've ever had to do is to admit God was just passing us by. You see, God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And the way God chose to manifest his glory at Westminster Chapel, do you know how he decided to do it? By passing us by. I felt offended. I felt betrayed. And I felt like Joshua when he saw this awesome figure with a sword. And Joshua says, are you for us or for them? And the commander of the Lord's army said, neither. Joshua might have said, well, I'm out of here. This is not right. But instead, he took off his shoes, fell on his face. Because what matters is the honor and glory of God. And if you want the honor and glory of God, you will go whatever brings him honor, not what will make you feel better. Jonathan Edwards said, The one thing the devil cannot reproduce in us is a love for the glory of God. If you have a love for the glory of God, you can be sure God put that there. Devil won't put that there. The flesh couldn't come up with it. And so ask, do you love his honor? You want his glory more than anything in the world? Good sign. And that way, if he comes to you, praise the Lord. (laughs) one day a a blind woman Fanny Crosby was uh, addressing prisoners and she was speaking on Romans 9.15 where God says I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy 
I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And she said to those prisoners, the Lord could pass you by. And a prisoner shouted out, oh Lord, don't pass by me. She went home and wrote the hymn. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Do you know it? Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Are you open to the way God may be pleased to manifest his glory, or if he were to pass you by? The man who ordained me to the ministry Dr. N.B. Magruder, now in heaven, and I were having a conversation. And uh, I said to him, Dr. Magruder, I guess the highest level of devotion to God would be the willingness to die, be a martyr. Would you agree? He looked at me, got out a sheet of paper, and wrote these words, and I've carried with me all over the world over the years. It says this, my willingness to forsake any claim upon God is the only evidence that I've seen the divine glory. It shook me rigid. You see, that's what Joshua had to learn. He thought, if God's going to work, it's going to be with us. And the commander of the Lord's army said, no, I'm just following him. And Joshua said, good enough for me, we want his glory. Then if I can leave you with a love for his glory, it's the greatest work that can happen by the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, take this word and apply this word by your Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus.